Ready. Welcome everybody to Metaphysics. I don't know who that person is. Go away. Okay. Uh, my name is Sam. Uh, I am here uh, teaching Metaphysics and Philosophy of Science this semester. And uh, next semester I go back to the Centre for Time at the University of Sydney, which is an interdisciplinary research group with physics, philosophy and psychology. We do things like uh, try and work out what time is, look at the physics of time, foundations of physics of time, and time travel paradoxes, fun stuff like that. And then uh, se first semester next year, I'm, I'm here permanently. The reason I'm telling you this is that if you like one of these courses, Metaphysics or Philosophy of Science, and you can only take one this semester, you can pick up the next one first semester next year if you've got time. Okay. So I've got consult hours. That's my room. Arts 1.24, which is very far away from where we are now. Why we are in the business building, I don't know. Um, it, is a, it is a kind of fancy room, though, so there's that. Um, feel free to drop by any time. I'm in most of the time, unless I'm off teaching somewhere. But also email me to make a time if you want to come by uh, sometime in particular. There's my website as well. If you should wish to read anything I've written, God help you. Okay, this is a course about time travel. What we're going to do in this course is get up to speed on uh, the, some of the uh, philosophy that you need to understand to be able to understand time travel. Some of the science, not much of the science, which is philosophy after all. And then uh, we're going to look at temporal paradoxes. So th these are paradoxes that arise when you do things like travel back in time and try and kill your grandfather before your father was born, or travel back in time and try and kill your infant self. What's going to happen? Um, we'll find out. So what we're going to do in the first part of the course is we're going to look at causation. To understand how time travel works, you need to have an understanding of causation, and the philosophy of causation is a, is a large area in metaphysics. So we're going to spend a fair bit of time talking about that. Then we're going to look at the nature of time. Lots of different models, theories about time that are out there. Some of them given to us by about science. Some of them inherited from philosophy. Some of them somewhere in between those two. And we're going to look at uh, sort of the state of the art on models of time. Again, in order to understand time travel, you need to understand how time works. And then, as I said, we're going to look at temporal paradoxes. So these are cases in which you take stuff from here about causation. Time travel involves causing things backwards in time. Whoa, this is a touch screen. <laughs> what? That's cool, but annoying. I shall never use the mouse again. Okay, so uh, you, in order to understand temporal paradoxes, you need to know how causation works, because you're traveling back in time to cause things in the past. So. Some standard understanding of causation is needed, and you also need to know how time works, because some paradoxes may be avoided by messing around with the nature of time. I should say that there are lots of things that you could do in a course on metaphysics. Metaphysics is one of the largest areas in philosophy. It's existed since, um, I mean, as a discipline, it's existed since the ancient times with people like Plato and Aristotle. But, you know, plausibly, a lot of the stuff that goes on in metaphysics, these are the sorts of questions that humans have been asking for a long time. Uh, so we're doing time causation and temporal paradoxes and time travel, but there are lots of things you could do. You could do <laughs> persistence across time. We will do a little bit of that. Uh, you could do the nature of persons, right? What sort of thing is a person? You may have done a little bit of that in your intro courses on personal identity. You can do stuff about uh, the nature of properties, what are properties, in fact, Pretty much for anything you can think of, there's a metaphysics of it, okay? And someone making a living writing about it. Okay, today what I want to do, though, is give you a sense of what metaphysics might be. Because standard understandings of metaphysics amongst the populace tend to be what you find in the New Age section in your local bookstore. And you'll be glad to know that is not what metaphysics is. Uh, but the question arises, what is metaphysics, right? What is its relationship to science? How does it work? What can you do with it? Uh, and then, as I said, weeks two to four, we're going to look at theories of causation. There are lots of different theories of causation out there. We're going to look at some of the major ones. Then we're going to look at theories of time, and then we'll look at paradoxes of time travel.
Okay, sorry, I'm getting the boring stuff out of the way first. There is assessment. Oh, God. Why is there assessment? You have to write an essay, and it's... Uh, so, something you should know, I didn't write these assessment criteria, so I inherited this course from people that had been running it previously, and this was already locked into the handbook, so I'm not allowed to change these. So the essay, uh, which is worth 50%, is due on Monday the 9th, and then you've got... That says tutorial and lecture attendance. In the handbook, it says that you can get points for coming to the tute or the lecture. In fact, actually, it says in the handbook that you have to do both. I'm just going to make it that you only have to come to the tute. <laughs> you only have to come to the tute to get that 10%, right? But you have to come to all of them. So something about this tute, uh, it says on the timetabling that it's a lecture. It's not a lecture, a two-hour lecture. I'm not going to lecture at you for three hours a week. I'm only going to lecture at you for this one hour each week. What that two-hour session is, is a workshop in which we will be doing practical exercises. Some of the practical exercises include things like formulating an argument for or against a position, building a causal model of a system, writing a consistent or an inconsistent time travel story, and then getting someone else to render it consistent. So we'll be doing mostly practical stuff in that time. You're not going to have to do presentations or anything like that, but I think it'll be really useful for you to come to those classes um, we're going to be learning a lot of the skills that you need to write your essay, right, in a practical way. Uh, this is false. There is no reader for the course. What I've done is I've put everything up on LMS. Did you tell them to start this week? Yes. Yeah, they don't start this week. So that means there's, this, is, this is your metaphysics fill for this week. There's no reader for the course, so you don't have to go and spend some money. Uh, it's all up on LMS. All the readings are up there already. So you just log on to LMS. The readings are there by week. Just pull them down. Read them, go nuts. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what metaphysics might be. So what is metaphysics? As I said, I doubt that uh, most people in everyday life have any sense of what metaphysics is, given that uh, you sometimes find metaphysics in the New Age uh, part of your bookstore. But the other thing you might think is, well, what's, what is the relationship between metaphysics and science? Right? So... Traditionally, there's been a lot of contention over whether metaphysics is a legitimate thing to do. Right? And people at various stages in history have argued that metaphysics is not a legitimate thing to do. It is not a legitimate academic area of inquiry. It does not tell you anything about the world. It is nonsense. So uh, in, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, the logical positivists famously held this view. They argued that metaphysics is literally meaningless, that we're not doing anything. We should be doing this instead, science. That's a pretty strong view to hold, but it's one that crops up repeatedly in the history of philosophy. And so when you do metaphysics, it is important to be aware that science exists, that we can't just sit in our armchairs and think about the world without connecting up to science at all, right? And it's important to think, on the other hand, that metaphysics may still be a useful thing to do. It may still tell us something about science. It may still have a role to play. It's not either of those things. Spoiler. Not exactly either of those things. Maybe some of those here, actually. Okay, so why should you care about metaphysics, though? You might think it's intrinsically valuable. People have thought that it's intrinsically valuable. That asking questions like, what is time? What is causation? What is the nature of a person? Is an intrinsically useful thing to do. You might also think that as I said, some of the biggest questions that we as, as humans have ever asked fall under the general rubric of metaphysics. And so if you think those are useful questions to ask, like why is there something rather than nothing? Why, does cause, why, does causation, why do causes always precede their effects and rarely, if ever, the other way around? Why do things in the past cause things in the future, but things in the future don't tend to cause things in the past? Why is that the case? Right? You might think that these are useful questions, um, but you might think that, again, that science has got it covered, that there's nothing for us to do in metaphysics that scientists aren't already in the business of doing. Another thing you might think is that metaphysics is useful for everyday life. That uh, answers to metaphysical questions might actually have moral upshots, for example, right? So a metaphysical question, such as, are there any objective moral truths, right? Do moral facts exist? That's a metaphysical question. You might think that that, that actually matters to us and might have genuine implications for 
how we live our lives. If there are no objective moral facts, right, then you've got, you may, may think you've got no reason to obey morality. You may think that you're better off just doing whatever the hell you want. I'll leave it to you to think of other things as we go through the course that metaphysics might be useful for. Okay, but here are some of the things that uh, people have actually said about why metaphysics might be, might be useful, what it might be in the business of doing. So one thing that uh, has been recently put forward is the idea that metaphysics is a kind of seed bank for science. So what metaphysics does is it explores conceptual possibilities, right? So, you know, what is causation? Well, a metaphysician comes along and gives you five different theories of causation. The scientist can then look at what metaphysics has done in that respect, look at the different theories of causation, and then use the conceptual resources that have been built up by metaphysics to help do science better. So this view is relatively popular these days. That's that metaphysics is sort of in the business of charting conceptual possibilities or possibility space, some kind of seed bank for, uh, for science but it's not auto an autonomous discipline. That's sort of critical to that picture of metaphysics. That doing metaphysics in the absence of science or not connecting it up to science or like just exploring conceptual possibilities without there ever being any possibility that would be useful in science is not a legitimate thing to do. Another thing you might think metaphysics is in the business of doing is building models of reality. Getting at the true fundamental nature of things. You know, when we ask what is what is causation? We're not just trying to give you some different theories of causation. We're trying to settle the facts about causation. What causation really is in the world. Or what time really is in the world. And we're trying to do it in a way that's autonomous from science. Well, not completely autonomous, but at least is not just a matter of doing science. This is, I suspect, the view that's most widely held by metaphysicians about metaphysics but it's also the one that you can see is going to be the most contentious. Because it's not, a, it's not obvious that there is any way of getting at the nature of reality other than by empirical means. And if there is a way of getting at, the getting at the nature of reality other than by empirical means, then we need an explanation of what that is. We need an account of how it is that you go about gaining knowledge about reality without doing science. Sorry? You might think it's religion, exactly, right? And that's one of the dangers here, is that if you open this up, right, and you think that this is a legitimate thing to do, then you might think that you legitimize various religious sorts of knowledge. Now, maybe you're okay with that. And traditionally, there's been a strong connection between religion and metaphysics. A lot of the people, for example, in the medi medieval period who did metaphysics were uh, religious in one way or another. Less so now. Most metaphysicians I know are atheists. But, but you can see the worry, right? The third thing, uh, again, intrinsic value. You might think that, look, we're not trying to learn anything about the world. Hell, we're not even really charting conceptual space very well. But what we're doing is nevertheless valuable. In what sense might it be valuable? Well, uh, you might think that it's uh, aesthetically value, valuable. You might think it's a kind of art, right? This is something that some philosophers have suggested, that metaphysics doesn't really tell you anything about the world. Doesn't even, it's not even that useful for science, but damn, it's pretty. Right. Um, where are we on this sort of series? You can kind of see that we're getting, in some sense, further away from it being valuable for everyday life, it being valuable for science. We're probably somewhere in here, right? Some, something between the seed bank for science and models of reality stuff. It is very difficult to know what to make of metaphysics. I've spent a long time trying to do metaphysics, and one of the things I think I've learned is that I have no idea what I'm doing as a discipline. I don't know where to put that discipline, whether to put it in science, whether to put it somewhere else. I think it's useful, but I don't know exactly what it is. That's not a question. Okay, so a couple of other things. I uh, just go a little bit into a little bit of detail on this idea of it being intrinsically valuable. I said that one way for it to be intrinsically valuable is for it to be pretty, aesthetically pleasing. Right? Um, there are sort of other ways that you can think about, about what it might be to be intrinsically valuable. So one of the things that metaphysics might be in the business of doing is uh, understanding our concepts of things. So what is our concept of causation? What are the necessary and sufficient conditions for something to count as being a cause? 
according to our causal concept. Right? Metaphysics might, and some people have suggested this, metaphysics might be the business of sharpening up our concepts so that we can then apply them elsewhere. So, uh, for example, a, a lot of concepts that appear in science get sharpened up by metaphysics. People in metaphysics explore concepts like cause and time, tell you what it is that our concept is like, so that we can then go and do things like operationalize it in science, work out how to test it, uh, and work out how to explore it empirically. So you might think that, it, and that's not exactly building a seed bank for science, and it's not exactly exploring all of the conceptual possibilities. What we're doing is trying to work out, as a matter of fact, what the concept is like. Uh, this can be useful for science, but it can also be useful in other areas. So there's a philosopher of, who works in caus causation, a guy called Jonathan Schaffer at Rutgers University in the States, who has been recent, recently writing a little bit of stuff uh, in legal journals, because the issue of causation matters for the law. And in particular, issues to do with absence causation. Whether or not you can have uh, the absence of something causing something else. So for example, if I fail to water my plants, I don't, actually don't own any plants, but if I did, if I failed to water them, they would die, right? But my failure is an absence of something. It's the lack of water that kills the plants. Is a lack genuinely something that can do causal work? Philosophers have argued no, that it's not something that can do genuine causal work. If they're right, then that's going to have implications for the law because often in cases of negligence and stuff like that, not doing something uh, imparts responsibility. And that's a kind of causal responsibility. Anyway, so metaphysics, I think, is actually a hybrid project. It's a lot of things. It does a lot of things, and it's a lot of things to a lot of people. There are actually... What we call metaphysics is really a cluster of different activities, different things. Some of them involve uh, sharpening up our conceptual tools so that we can do science better. Some of them involve charting conceptual possibilities. And some of them may even involve trying to understand reality and trying to get at the basis of reality. I think it's a mistake to try and pigeonhole metaphysics into one particular thing. I think it's a lot of different things. What we're going to be doing is trying to learn truths about time as much as we can, as well as modeling various possible options for understanding the universe, both, both in the temporal sense and in the causal sense. While this is a course about time travel, in some sense, that's a vehicle for getting at these other areas of metaphysics. Because time travel is interesting because it raises all these issues to do with causation and time, and those are big areas of metaphysics, and we're going to be exploring those things by looking at uh, time travel. Okay. So metaphysics, in short, who knows what metaphysics kind of know it when you see it, but I don't think there is a general story about what it's in the business of doing. But what we'll be doing is trying to get at causation and time. All right, so what I want to do for the rest of uh, today is do a little bit of tool building. Metaphysics, you will quickly find out, has a lot of weird stuff in it. And a lot of that weird stuff can be, can, can be really off-putting when you first see it, right? It can, you can see people talking about certain things, certain notions that... A, you just don't get, and B, insofar as you do get, they look completely spooky and completely suspicious, right? So some of the, I, I call these things tools because actually some of them tend to be really useful. And there are two uh, tools in particular that I'm going to focus on. Um, and by getting a handle on these tools, you'll, it's useful for other areas in philosophy because what you'll see is a lot of the stuff that's, that's done in metaphysics turns up in other areas of philosophy. A lot of the tools that get sharpened here end up having applications elsewhere. So if I give you a little bit of this tool building stuff, you should be able to use it for other philosophy stuff as well. Yay. Okay. The first one is the notion of a possible world. Whenever I teach metaphysics, uh, this concept uh, tends to make people a bit sad or scared. So possible worlds uh, fall into an area of metaphysics to do with modality. And modality deals with what could be the case, what might be the case, what has to be the case. Right? Those are modal notions. Things like necessity, possibility are all modal notions. The question arises as to how we understand those modal notions. Right? So when I say uh, I could have had a different shirt on, right? what am I saying about that? What am I saying about reality? What am I saying at all? How do we understand what I just said? And uh, the sort of uh, one of the big conceptual revolutions that's 
happened in metaphysics, I would say, in the last 30 years or so, is to understand modality in terms of possible worlds. And there are various strengths or various sort of metaphysical assumptions you can build into this notion of a possible world to make it uh, more or less spooky. I'm going to give you the, the sort of craziest version of this view. This is the version that David Lewis defends. And it's the view according to which our world, our universe, is just one of many that are just like ours in terms of being sort of big chunks of space-time, which is what our world is like, but there are many that are disconnected from ours. And when I say I could have worn a different shirt, what I'm actually saying is there is a world that's disconnected from this one in which I, me, wear a different shirt. This is the craziest version of the view. This is the view that these, uh, these worlds are concrete chunks of reality that are disconnected from ours. Now, I mean, I say it's crazy, but there are actually some people in science who are saying sort of similar things, right? So there's this uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics called the many worlds interpretation, which you can sort of tell from the title is not that far away from this idea, the idea being that there are many different possible realities, although I think in the quantum mechanical case they're connected to ours. These are supposed to be completely disconnected. Okay, so as I said, this is a tool. It's also a metaphysical position. Should we believe in the existence of other worlds? And how, what evidence could we ever have that a world completely disconnected from ours exists? Um, the craziest version is that there are such things. The more moderate version is that talking about possible worlds is a, is a really useful heuristic model for understanding modal talk. Right? So you can think of it, uh, think of worlds not as big concrete chunks of space-time existing out there in some multiverse of many different possible realities, but rather as more like stories. So imagine a consistent story about a, that dis completely describes a world or a, or a possible reality. A possible world just is one of those consistent stories, and you can use those consistent stories to build yourself a model of modal talk. So when I say that necessarily uh, I had to wear this shirt today, so that's a metaphysical necessity, uh, then what I'm saying is that according to all these stories we might tell about possible reality, in every single one I'm wearing one of these shirts. Right, so you can use it as a, in this kind of model. If, you, if you're familiar with model building in science, sometimes you build sort of mathematical models which represent the world or, or try to represent the world. These are similar. They're not mathematical models per se, but they have a similar kind of flavor. You, you're using some kind of abstract construct to model something. Right? In this case, we're using it to model modality. I mean, you might still think that's pretty contentious. That's still a metaphysical position. I just told you that there are abstract constructs. What the hell is an abstract construct? Right? Give me a metaphysics of that, you might say. Fair enough, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so here, what we actually do is we use these possible worlds to build a semantics. And by that, I mean an account of what our modal talk means. Right? And this will be important later on as we go through the course because some of the accounts of causation that we'll meet are explicitly modal. They use modal language and modal concepts to understand the nature of causation. And indeed, when we're talking about time travel, we're talking about paradoxes, and paradoxes are about what is impossible. So you need to understand or have a concept of the relevant modal talk to understand what's going on there. Okay, but this is the possible world semantics. And if, if you can, I want you to sort of, you know, be prepared to work with it and, you know, use the kind of semantics, but sort of just cleave off the metaphysical question of what the hell these possible worlds are, right? Because they sort of pay their way in terms of their usefulness in building the semantics for modality, whatever they might be. Okay, so P is possible. Uh, this little thing here, I double F is not a typo. It means if and only if it's a logical connective. Yep. Uh, yes, it would be better to say that. Because otherwise, it's like iterated modality. Imagine that that's what it says. Uh, P, is, P is possible if there exists at least one world in which P. Um, and P is necessary if in every world that exists, P. Right. So imagine I'm telling all these consistent stories about 
reality. And every story I tell, it is the case that a certain claim sort of shows up in that story. Right? Um, here's a, an example. Don't take this too seriously. But uh, suppose that God does actually exist. Right? God exists, then God exists necessarily. It's one of the fun things about God. God exists necessarily, then he exists at every possible world. There is no world in which God doesn't exist, which means whenever I tell, try and tell a story, a consistent story about reality, God's in it. Okay, so there are different kinds of worlds, and these different kinds of worlds um, line up to different kinds of modality. And our everyday thought and talk is shot through with different notions of modality. So, for example, when I say, you ought not uh, litter, right? You must not litter. I don't mean it's physically impossible for you to litter, right? What I mean is that something like it's morally impermissible or it's legally impermissible. Those are different modal notions, and you can understand them using the framework of possible worlds. So the first one here, uh, physical possibility. So physical possibility is what is possible given the laws of nature. Right? Uh, so it's physically possible for me to quantum tunnel back to my office in on the other side of, wh where are we, Fremantle, I think? <laughs> it's physically possible, but it's extremely unlikely. Nevertheless, it's permitted by the laws of nature. Right? And that's what physical possibility is all about. Physical necessity is what the laws of nature demand. Right? Economic possibility, right? So you can imagine that certain things are economically possible. It's, it's uh, economically impossible for me to borrow $3 million. Well, it's probably somewhat, some bank would probably do it. Uh, and then you've got uh, logical possibility. So logical possibilities are, for some people, the widest notion of possibility. What is just consistent, right? So it's completely consistent for me to have a zebra's head on my shoulders, and for me to not have this head that I have. You might not think there's much difference, but let me tell you. I could have a zebra's head on my shoulders, right? It's not physically possible. I would probably, well, maybe it is physically possible. <laughs> um, let's say it's not physically possible. It's not physically possible, but it's probably logically possible, right? There's probably some world in which a creature kind of like me has a zebra for a head. It's probably just got different laws of nature to our world that permit such things, different laws of evolution, whatever. And so on. You've got moral possibility. Moral possibility uh, is a way of understanding uh, moral ought claims, right? So I ought to, I ought not to lie. That means that it's necessary that I don't lie, right? Or necessary I shouldn't lie. Okay. What's interesting about the uh, possible worlds is that you can imagine. Imagine a big floaty space full of globes, is how I think about possible worlds. And you can imagine there are spheres, like rings, around certain sets of worlds, right? So the physical possible world, physically possible worlds, there's a sort of golden, golden ring around those ones, and we're in the middle of that. And then you might think that there's the uh, um, logically possible worlds, and there's another golden ring around those ones. And there's all these different sort of spheres of possibility that line up with these different modal notions. What we can do is imagine that the actual world is this globe, right? We're all kicking around in this universe here. And there's all these other universes around. What we can do is we can order those universes based on how similar they are to our world and based on certain criteria or along certain dimensions, right? So for example, imagine we want to order the worlds based on how similar their laws of nature are to our world. So you take all of the worlds, you look at all their laws of nature, you look at all the stories which describe those worlds, and they describe certain laws that obtain. And then you take our world and you order them based on their relative similarity. So the further away you are from our world in the space of possibility, the, the kind of outermost reach, the globe that's right out the edge, that's got completely different laws to our world. But a world that's like right next to ours, that's got similar laws. Uh, it's kind of like our world except, you know, maybe the speed of light's a bit slower. 299,000 kilometers per second rather than 300,000 kilometers per second. Or, um, I don't know, the inverse square law is actually cube law. That would actually that would completely destroy everything. <laughs> it would be quite 
different. Okay, so here's what I just got you to picture, right? So here we are in the actual world. You'll see why this is all, I mean, this is all, you might think, oh, this is all fun, what are we doing here, fossil worlds, yay. But you'll see that we're actually going to use this to understand causation as we go through, right? This is going to have some uh, practical application. So here we are in the actual, <laughs> I'm not going to get used to that in a hurry. Okay, here we are in the actual world, and it, these rings represent different spheres of possibility. And indeed, what we've done is we've ordered these, the, all of the worlds based on how similar they are in terms of various dimensions, right? So imagine this is like physical possibility here. All of these worlds are ordered relative to the actual world based on how similar they are to the actual world in terms of the laws of nature. Okay? Right, so imagine this is logical possibility, the orange ring around the edge. What the hell is outside of that? I think that must be the dragon I'm trying to call in and tell us. Look, the, what I'm telling you about is a possible world's account of what's possible, right? In recent times, and this is one of the, I think, coolest things that philosophers have done lately, is try to understand impossibility using a similar kind of framework and talk about impossible worlds as well as possible worlds. Now, it may sound completely crazy, it's easy to sound crazy when I say things like that when we talk about the, when we're thinking of the really strong picture of possible worlds that I began. It's the idea that there are these concrete realities out there. What the hell is an impossible concrete reality that sort of exists? Like, uh -huh. But if you think about it in terms of stories, <coughs> then it's much easier to understand how this would work, right? So a possible world is like a consistent story that you can tell. Impossible world, it's an inconsistent story. And it's possible to tell inconsistent stories, stories that explicitly contradict themselves. Anyway, we're not going to have to worry about impossibility so much, even if it is really cool. That's a picture of the actual world. I think we're on to our second tool now. So the first tool was uh, modality, broadly speaking, and understanding modality using possible worlds. Framework. What we're going to be dealing with when we get to causation are things called counterfactual. Counterfactuals are a particular kind of claim that we find in language that we use all the time and they're really useful and we typically use a possible world semantics to understand them. So a counterfactual would be if I had not gotten up this morning, I would not have made it to this lecture. As a matter of fact, I did get up this morning and I did make it to this lecture. But if I hadn't, then I wouldn't have made it. Right? Counterfactual, contrary to fact. There's a long and storied history about how to understand counterfactual claims, but the framework we're going to be using is this one. We're going to use possible worlds to understand counterfactuals, and then you can use counterfactuals to understand causation, because what I just said actually kind of sounded causal, right? It sounded like a causal claim. If it sounds like me getting up in the morning has something causally to do with me getting here to give you a lecture today. You can make it more, make the causal connection tight, if I hadn't struck the match, the match wouldn't have lit. I did strike the match, the match did light, but if I hadn't, it wouldn't. You might think that that is a way of understanding causation. Anyway, we'll get to that. Okay, so the second thing we're going to need, the second tool, is space-time. Now, I'm, I'm not qualified, nor would I want to give you a full-blown account of relativistic mechanics here. What I'm just going to give you a sense of the kinds of diagrams and pictures that we use to depict uh, space-time. The reason that's important is because when you're, as some of the accounts of causation that we'll encounter explicitly use space-time as a framework for understanding causation, and I don't think that you can get a handle on how these contemporary accounts of causation work without having at least some sense of what this, this god-awful thing is here. Um, also, uh, possible worlds for some people are defined in terms of this thing. Okay, what is space-time? Well, that's just a bit more on the okay, space-time. Anyone seen Donnie Darko? Anyone seen The Matrix? I had this disconcerting moment recently where I was talking to some first-year undergraduates and I was trying to explain to them what epistemology is, right? So knowledge. You know, you've seen The Matrix, right? And they're like, what? <laughs> uh oh It was over a decade ago, I guess. Okay. So in Donnie Darko, there's that bit where he's 
uh, thinking about getting a beer from the fridge, and this like tube extends from his chest, and then he like and you see it go out and it like grabs the beer from the fridge, and then he gets up and he follows the tube. That's that's in some sense a very sort of basic representation of this this sort of notion here of a world line through space time, and what we're going to uh, be using is this notion of a world line. As I said, I'm not I'm not going to give you a full uh, blown run through of this, and you don't really need to know exactly how it all works. Uh, but I will give you a bit of an introduction. So, this is um, this is a Newt Newtonian space time. So this is a space time that you could use to model uh, physics before the 20th, 20, 20th century. Okay. Um, so what? Imagine you've got time, and imagine that an instant of time is this sheet running through space, right? All of the things that happen now and this instant along that sheet through all of space, okay? So things that are happening out in the Andromeda galaxy, things that are happening, I don't know, some other part of the universe, I don't know, I'm not an astronomer. Those things are all happening now on this, on this sheet. And you can imagine time as a stack of sheets, right? And as we're going through time, making our way into the future, we're moving through that stack of sheets to the inevitable, horrible endpoint of the world, whatever that might be. Okay. So in a Newtonian space-time, the thing to keep in mind is that everyone, no matter how fast you're moving, no matter what you tend to be doing, no matter who you are, we're all moving through the same stack of sheets. There is just one stack. Everyone agrees on what the stack is. So everyone agrees that dinosaurs existed 65 million years ago, everyone agrees that uh, World War II happened 60 odd years ago. We all agree on those things, uh, and it doesn't matter. Like, there's, there's sort of, there's no, no way of challenging those facts. Those, those facts are set in stone in a Newtonian picture. But just keep that stack idea in mind, right? There's a stack of sheets, and we're moving through that stack, right? As you live your life, you're moving through the stack. So if you imagine the world as one of those stacks, of spatial sheets, a world line is you traveling through that stack as you get older. Okay. So as I said, that's a Newtonian picture. We're not, we can't work with a Newtonian picture because it's um, false, which is uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a problem. Because actually there is no fact of the matter as to what the stack of the sheets looks like. And this is what relativistic mechanics tells us. It tells you that if I'm traveling at a certain speed and you're traveling relative to me, we're going to disagree about the ordering of events. So if I travel at uh, half the speed of light, then you have to travel very fast for this to actually happen. But if I travel at half the speed of light, you tra you're standing still and I zoom past you, right? And I'm on a, on a spaceship, and for some reason the two ends of the spaceship get struck by lightning. I will move into one lightning strike and move away from the other one. So the one I'm moving towards, I'll see that one first, and then I'll see the other one. But you, who are standing still, who see the two lightning strikes, they'll reach you at the same time. You'll see them as simultaneous, I won't. The problem is that, from my perspective, all of the laws of nature are good. Uh, speed of light is uh, a constant speed. There's no, uh, there's no, nothing sort of funny going on. It's not like my spaceship is making the world change or weirding things out. But similarly, from your perspective, completely fine. Laws of nature, working perfectly, speed of light is the speed that it should be at, and yet, things are different for the two of us. And this is one of the big lessons of relativity, is that, well, we can't agree on temporal ordering anymore. There is no fact of the matter as to which events are past and which events are future. It really depends on how fast you're going. Okay, so as I said, we don't, we don't need to know that too much, too much about it. What I really want to get, oh, get at is the way that we use diagrams to sort of picture this. So this is the temporal axis and this is the spatial axis, right? Uh, when you speed up, your temporal and spatial axes change, right? So how far events are from each other gets further apart as you speed up or closer together as you speed up, depending on your trajectory through space-time. And so what we do is we use these sort of bending axes to represent uh, distance and travel and, and uh, travel through space-time. Okay, so here's just a representation of what I was saying. You've got uh, three events, A, B, and C. You're moving at one speed, so that's one observer. They're all simultaneous. Someone moving faster, they're at that order. And there's someone moving uh, at a different pace, they're in that order. Right? And this is just what relativity tells us. 
Anyway, so the space-time diagrams, come back to that stack of sheets, right? You still have the stack. And for you, as an observer, moving through the world, there'll be a particular stack of sheets that's sort of your stack. But me, I've got a different stack. And my world line through the world moves through a stack of sheets that's different to your world line moving through your stack. Space-time is a way of taking your stack and my stack, formulating them into a big metric which allows for uh, changes in space, spatial and temporal dis distance of that kind, but the metric itself was invariant. So we won't agree on the temporal ordering of events. We won't even agree on the spatial distance between events, but we'll agree on the spatio-temporal distance, which is a function of those two things, and allows us to unify all of our stacks into one big thing, which is that thing. Okay. You've got a stack of ordering sheets. I've got a stack of sheets. They're both good, good, good stacks, and we can build a geometry which includes both of them and says that they're both okay. And movement through the universe is movement through that geometry, and that geometry is space-time. Okay, pretty much all you really need to worry about is that when I draw a picture like this, and I draw like a, a, a squiggle running through it up there, that represents an object moving through the universe. Okay, so how much time do we have? All right, just quickly, uh, laws of nature. So the, the third sort of thing we'll need is a notion of a law. So what is a law? A law is, who knows what a law is, but the basic idea is that there's, there's sort of universal generalizations that aren't accidents. So here's a universal generalization, that's an accident. Everyone in the philosophy department has hair. That's actually false, but everyone in the philosophy department has hair, right? It's not a law of nature that everyone in the philosophy department has to have hair. And nevertheless, it's a universal generalization. That's an accidental one. A non-accidental gener universal generalization, its entropy always increases, right? So if you've ever got a closed system with no energy going in, then the entropy of that system, the degree of disorder that it has, will increase over time. And that is not an accident. That is a law of nature. <coughs> yeah, we can just skip some of this stuff, I think. Okay, so just quickly, there are two broad pictures about the laws of nature. Two broad metaphysical pictures. Yes, there's a metaphysics of the laws. Are you surprised? Probably not. There's two pictures of the laws. One of them is that you've got space-time and the laws sort of arise out of space-time. The other picture is you've got the laws and space-time 